Hey everyone and welcome to Battle Brothers. So, Battle Brothers is an open world turn-based tactical RPG kind of game. It's a bit like XCOM meets Mountain Blade. It was in early access for a while and got its full release just yesterday, on March the 24th. I am playing 1.0 version, as you can see in the bottom right corner. It's a pretty damn good game, so we're going to play it a bit. now. I'm far from an expert in this game, however, I did already play a little bit, around 10 hours or so, give or take an hour or two. So I'm familiar with all the base mechanics and I'm familiar with a few things that are less than obvious when you are first starting out. So I will go through all the basics and maybe explain a few other things that might not be as obvious when starting out. So, let's go straight into the game, shall we? There are some scenarios which are basically like mini-tutorials. You can learn some combat basics, you can learn some concepts like the high ground, you can get a late game encounter and things like that. But I won't be doing that, we will be starting an actual proper campaign. And I think we'll play on veteran difficulty. Now, this game is still pretty damn hard, even on beginner. The main thing the difficulty level affects is how many resources you start with. You can actually see it on the tooltip. On Expert you will get less starting funds, you will get more challenging contracts and opponents, and lower contract payments. But Beginner is still not that easy, let's just say. This game is hard, I'll just get it out of the way <laughs> before I even start playing. So if you are looking for a challenge, Battle Brothers is pretty good when it comes to that. Anyway, let's choose our company name. It's going to be... The Mar Brigade, because why not? You can choose Late Game Crisis, but I didn't get that far into the game to know the difference between these. We'll go with Random. And we can also choose our banner. I like this one. <laughs> okay, let's go with that one, why not? This game has quite a lot of text to read, but I won't be reading it all out loud. You can pause the video and read it if you like, but I will try to maintain a decent pace. So I will mostly skip all of this. So this right here is a fight you get into every time you start a new campaign, and it's basically always the same. And before we start talking about any combat mechanics, Let's talk about the stats that you can see at the bottom of the screen. So first of all we got action points, which are fairly self-explanatory. Each action uses action points, so if you want to move, you will use action points. You can see how many exactly I will use if I want to execute this particular move. Using attacks also uses action points, and you can also see whether I'll be able to use this skill after moving or not. So if I move this far, I will not be able to use it. If I move like this, I will be able to use it. Then we got fatigue. Every action you take builds up fatigue. And if you hit the maximum, if you feel the whole fatigue meter, you will not be able to do anything, basically. You will have to wait. So fatigue is one of the most important concepts and stats in the game, especially for some classes that use a lot of fatigue, because some weapons use more fatigue than others, and some actions use more fatigue than others. You definitely need to keep an eye on this, and fatigue management is pretty damn important. Then we got morale, which is also fairly self-explanatory. A lot of things affect morale, and at its worst, morale can make you run away, or it can make your brothers just break and run away, which is obviously not good for you. Then we got head armor and body armor. Now, you can hit the head, and every hit to the head, if you don't have armor, is an automatic critical hit. So headgear is massively important in this game. You never want to go without any headgear. In fact, I would go as far as saying headgear is more important than body armor. Because if you get hit in the head without any helmet, it will be an automatic critical hit. So you can get insta gibbed a lot if you go without headgear, just something to keep in mind. Then you got body armor, which is fairly self-explanatory again. When you take damage, you first take damage to the armor, other than damage that can go through armor. There is some damage that can do, go through armor. Some weapons are better, 
at bypassing armor than others, but as a general rule, you have to destroy armor first before you kill someone. Most of the time. There's more to it than that, but I'm just covering the basics right now. And then we got hit points, which again are fairly self explanatory. <laughs> if these go down to zero, you die. Although, not always, but we'll go into that later. Anyway, these are the stats. We can also check our inventory, but we'll talk about this a little bit later, because there are quite a lot of stats here that I would also like to talk about. But we'll do that later. Anyway, combat mechanics. So first of all, here's the turn order down here. So right now, Arnie the Butcher will go first, then Asgir will go next, and Erhard will go last. However, you can wait turn and be moved to the end of the queue. However, if you do that, you will act later next round. So this is a really interesting choice you have to make. Whether you want to wait or end your turn. If you end your turn, you will go as normal the next turn. If you think it will be more beneficial to take a shot with this guy, maybe after these dudes move towards us, you can wait, but you will also act later on the next turn. Just something to keep in mind. Anyway, this is our ranged guy. He uses a crossbow. And an interesting thing to know about this game is that skills that you will see right here are dictated by your weapons, not by your character. So if I change my weapon, I will get completely different skills. These are effectively weapon skills, as you will see once I go with other guys. So we'll take a shot with the crossbow and we can see that we got 58% chance to hit. Now, chance to hit is basically your melee or ranged skill minus your enemy's melee defense or ranged defense. There are some other modifiers, so for example, high ground can affect it, various weapons have bonuses, sometimes you get penalties, but this is the base calculation. You take your ranged skill and you subtract your enemy's ranged defense and then take any other modifiers into account. So we'll take a shot at this guy and we actually hit him. And you can also hover over your enemy or over your own brothers to see how much armor they have. So head armor, body armor, how much health they have, also their morale and their fatigue and any injuries they might have. So we can see this guy is wavering and he has pierced arm muscles. That's not good for him. And now we can reload. When you hover over the skill, you see how many action points it will use and how much fatigue it will build up. So reloading our crossbow will build up 20 fatigue, which is unfortunate, but it's obviously necessary. Otherwise we won't be able to shoot. Now we got Asgir. And as you can see, we got other skills here now. And these are from his weapon, again. All these skills down here are weapon skills. So we have Split Man, which will cost 6 action points, build up 15 fatigue, and it will do quite a bit of damage. Now, as a general rule, there are a lot of different weapons in this game. Some are better than others, but from my experience so far, which is quite limited, but I do have some experience already, you can make most weapons work, you just need to build your strategy around it. But you can make most weapons work, some are better than others. Some are better in the early game than others. And two handers will do massive damage. It's pretty easy to just insta-gib your opponent with a two-hander, especially if he has weak armor or if he doesn't have headgear, for example. Like, this guy doesn't have headgear. If we hit him in the head, with a two-hander, he will probably just die instantly. However, the downside is that you can't use shields with two-handers, obviously. And shields are really damn strong in this game. Using a shield is the biggest defensive boost you can get for the cost, because a lot of shields are very cheap and they give you a massive defensive boost. Early on, it's a pretty good idea to use shields on everyone or almost everyone. Anyway, we can see that we can't move into this guy's melee range and then still use the attack. And another important thing to know about this game is attack of opportunity mechanic. So once you move into melee range of your enemy or he moves into your melee range, you cannot move out without taking damage. Or in other words, if you try to move out, he will get an attack of opportunity. And attacks of opportunity in Battle Brothers are not like attacks of opportunity in Dungeons and Dragons. 
they are much harsher here. If you try to move at all, so not just move out of his melee range, if you try to move at all to a different tile adjacent to him, he will get a chance to attack you. And you will not be allowed to move a lot of the time. So your move is not guaranteed, you are attempting to move. What can happen a lot of the time is that if you try to run away, because let's say someone is wanted, maybe he lost too much armor and he wants to move out of melee range, you will get multiple unsuccessful attempts and you will just get killed because your enemy will get several attacks for free. So the best way to flee melee range is to use certain skills. If you use a shield, you get a skill called shield push, which can push your enemy one tile. So that's one of the best ways to run away with someone who's in melee range. Use a shield push ability. Attempting to move out without doing that is a really bad idea and it will get you killed most of the time. Sometimes you have no choice and you feel like you have to do it, but attempting to move once you are in melee range is just a terrible, terrible idea. Don't do it. Anyway, let's maybe wait until the end of the turn with this guy and we'll move with our shield guy. So this guy is using a spear and the spear is, I would say, one of the best early game weapons, if not the best early game weapon, because the spear gets plus 20% chance to hit with its base attack. So that's really damn good. The downside is that spears are not very good at dealing with armor. You can see that 25% of the damage ignores armor, so that's not a whole lot. And it's 90% effective against armor. There are weapons that are much, much better against armor than spears. But as a general rule, using a spear and a shield is one of the best setups you can get in the early game. Especially since, like I said, shields give you a massive defensive boost. And they give you this ability, knockback. You use your shield to knock the target away by one tile best way to run away with someone who's wounded. Anyway, oh yeah, you also get the spear wall ability, which is kind of like Overwatch. You will get an attack for free if the enemy moves into your melee range. So that can be quite useful if you set up a defensive line and then just use spear wall. Right, so let's move into this dude's melee range. So now he can't move without triggering attack of opportunity. He's effectively locked in. And now we'll get our other guy. So we might as well just move him into melee as well. And when you have more than one brother adjacent to an enemy, you will get bonus chance to hit for each subsequent attack. Surrounding your enemies is generally the best way to kill them, because you will get bonuses and they will build up. Also, here's another mechanic, friendly fire. If I attempt to shoot one of these guys, not only my chance to hit is very low, because my line of fire is blocked, I can end up hitting my own dudes. Which is not what you want most of the time, let's just say. We can move around and then take a shot from the side. So now we got 64% chance to hit because line of sight is not obstructed and there's no risk that I'll hit my own guy. And that's a very nice hit right there. Now he has a grazed neck. And we can probably kill him, we got 78% chance to hit. No. Not quite, we hit his armor. Alright. So here's the two-hander. I'll show you the two-hander. So that's the woodcutter's axe. It's 125% effective against armor, and 40% of the damage ignores armor. It also has damage range of 35 to 70. So this will do massive damage, but you can't use a shield with a two-hander. So you are definitely way more vulnerable compared to a guy with a shield. And unfortunately we missed. Okay then. Now they will go. Okay, one guy is dead. Now I could attack, but I only got 15% chance to hit. Not a good idea. We'll move to the side in case we fail to kill him right now. We got 60% chance to hit with the 200. And he's dead. We chopped his head off. Very nice. We can see how much experience we got, how much damage we received, how much damage we dealt, and who got how many kills. And we can also see how badly wounded they are. They will heal by tomorrow. And we can also grab the loot. You have to actually pick up the loot. 
but there is an option to pick it up automatically, which you might or might not want to use depending on how late into the game you are, because later in the game you will run out of inventory space and you might not want to load all the junk that comes your way. I keep it turned off, but you can turn it on. So, that's the aftermath. Again, feel free to pause the video and read all of this. I won't be doing that, just to keep a decent pace. There's quite a bit of text. Now, the world map is procedurally generated every time you start a new game. So, if I quit back to the main menu and start a new game now, this will be completely different. And I like that. Now, our first objective is to go back to Sonheim and get paid, because we basically finished the contract and we need to go and get paid. Now, the world map is run in real time, so you might want to keep the game paused if you are not doing anything. If you are standing in one spot and the game is not paused, the time will still run and you will use food and things like that. So yeah, just something to keep in mind. We can use fast speed to go back a little bit faster. And here's the town. We will get paid. And we can accept another contract from the same guy or decline. We will accept. We'll get paid 400. And our next fight will be... Actually, we'll have to wait a little bit longer to get the follow-up. That's fine. We have to visit the next town next. Alright, so recruit at least three more men, buy weapons and armor. For sure, we are down to only three brothers. That's definitely not good. We do have the Fangshire, which is headgear piece that will give us 60 armor. And it allows the wearer to see at night and negates any penalties due to nighttime. That is quite nice. I might give it to our ranged guy, perhaps. Although, it's best to use headgear that doesn't affect fatigue on ranged guys. And more importantly, headgear that doesn't affect vision, because some headgear actually affects your vision. None of the ones that we have, but just something to keep in mind. Anyway, the town. Each town has various additional buildings that you can use. This one doesn't have a whole lot. We just got the market and some people for hire. Now, we should definitely hire all of these. But one thing to keep in mind is that the cost doesn't necessarily indicate how good they are going to be. But the things that you need to know is that first you have the upfront hiring fee, which is this one, that's 200 for this guy and then the daily wage, so you will have to pay him that much daily. And then, each one of these guys has a background. And backgrounds are actually quite interesting, because they affect two things. First, they affect some stats. So, for example, tailors are not used to hard physical labor. There's a whole list that you can look up with exact effects of each background. I only remember a few. But... For example, the Caravan Hunt, I remember this one, has additional maximum fatigue. So that's a pretty useful class. Any class that gets extra fatigue is nice, because fatigue is just so important. And the second effect of the backgrounds is that some backgrounds unlock various events, or you can get events that are related to this particular person, because of his background. So I know tailors can actually craft some stuff later in the game as you might guess from their background. But basically you get stats and you get events that are related to backgrounds. Early on we are going to hire everyone because there are only three available and we need some good core brothers. Unfortunately you cannot check their stats before hiring them, which is why sometimes you need to gamble. And I will show you why that's important in just a second. We'll just hire all of these guys and we can check them out. So now we can talk about this screen. I already explained most of these stats in here, but there are a few other things that are really important to know. So some of the skills will have starts, anywhere from one to three starts. This indicate talent, and this basically tell you that you will get more attribute points in this particular stat if you level it up. So when this guy levels up, 
I can choose to increase this attribute, range defense, and I will get more points in range defense than I otherwise would without these stars. So what you want early on to build your core is find some brothers with talents in the most important skills. And some of the most important skills other than fatigue include melee skill as well as ranged skill and then melee defense and ranged defense. If you want a good melee guy, you want someone with talent in melee skill and or melee defense because these are both pretty important. Anyone with talent in fatigue is also pretty good. And health is actually less important than you might think. I'm not saying health is not important because it obviously is, but focusing on health too much can be a bit of a mistake from my experience. But obviously more health is a good thing. Just don't focus on it too much. Not to the point where you would neglect defense, for example. It's good to have high defense. So if you have a melee guy, you don't want to build up his melee defense. That is an important stat. Anyway, some other things that we should talk about are these. Let's just leave this turn for a moment. So, first we got crowns, which is basically gold. Then we have provisions, which is food that will run out. You need food to travel, basically. As you might have guessed. Then we got tools and supplies. Tools and supplies are used to repair your gear automatically. So when you go into inventory, we can see that some of our gear will have this hammer icon. That means it will get repaired over time, as long as you have enough tools. Then we have ammunition, which is used to fire crossbows and bows. And then we got medical supplies. Medical supplies will also get used automatically to heal any injuries we might have. Then, we also have Factions and Relations screen. So, this screen is really important because of Renown. Renown is one of the most important stats in the game to keep track of. Because you gain Renown as you accept and complete contracts. Contracts are kind of like quests that you get in towns. Each contract will give you some Renown if you complete it successfully. And the game scales with Renown. So the higher your Renown gets, there are something like 12 tiers. So you will go up to a higher tier when you accumulate enough Renown. So the higher your Renown is, the bigger and more difficult enemy groups will be. The game scales up with Renown, so the consequence of that is that it's not always the best idea to just go around and do contracts all the time, because the game can scale up a little bit too much, for how strong or how weak your party is. You want to make sure that you are ready. So it can be a good idea to just go explore around the map, do some random encounters. Now winning a fight will also increase your renown, but not nearly as much as completing contracts will. So you can get kind of ahead of the curve by just roaming around the map and doing random encounters that are not related to contracts. You will eventually want to do contracts anyway, but I'm just saying, it's not necessarily the best idea to focus exclusively on contracts. And building up your gold is also massively important, and there are other ways to build up your gold than doing contracts. So we also got reputation. Right now we are neutral, but this will change based on your actions. And reputation is actually pretty interesting, because as you can see on the tooltip already, you will get different kinds of contracts and people will react differently to you based on your actions. So that's just something to keep in mind. And then we also got relations with the houses, but I think it's a little bit too early to talk about that. Alright, so... First, let's check the gear, because we don't need gear. And actually, even before we talk about gear, let's talk about the starting brothers. Because the three brothers that you start the game with, the ones involved in the very first fight, require more gold daily early on, and it's not an insignificant difference. They will require 11 gold daily, right here, if you check the tall tip. And the three guys that we recruited required 6 gold, 6 gold and 9 gold daily. Which means that we could almost get two brothers for the cost of one. It can be worth just dismissing these three. If you really want to min-max your gold, it's something to consider. 
I'm just saying. Just something you should be aware of, that these guys will require more gold daily. But I'm not going to dismiss them. Anyway, we need to buy some gear. So, let's check the market. Now, every town will have different prices, and sometimes there are events that affect towns. This one doesn't have any, but it's something to keep an, an eye on. Sometimes the town is raided, and it won't have a lot of goods to sell you, and they will have higher prices. Sometimes it's well supplied, and it will give you better prices and better supplies. The important thing to know is that you can check how much something is worth by hovering over it, and then you can see how much the town will actually price it at. So if you run low on, let's say, tools and supplies, you might not want to rush to buy, let's say, this one for 294 gold. You can get a better price than that. Same with selling things. If you have something that's very valuable to sell, do not sell it at the first town you see, because you might get a really terrible price at that town. Especially if it's negatively affected by some really bad events. You can get a really terrible price. You can end up losing hundreds of gold. So that's just one thing to keep in mind. Anyway, how many hearts do we need? Because, like I mentioned during the fight, having headgear for everyone is really damn important, even if it's not very good headgear, but you need some headgear. We need two helms, I would say, and... Let's see, probably some shields. Can we buy any spears? Because a spear is one of the best weapons early on because of the extra chance to hit. You cannot actually see the chance to hit on the tooltip of the actual weapon, because it's the bonus the skill has. So if you don't know that bonus is there, you will not find out from the actual spear tooltip, because it won't tell you. Anyway, we will also buy a shield. This one is slightly better, so that one will do. And the hat, let's see. These are not amazing, but we'll grab them anyway. All right. We also have some javelins, so these are like short-range thrown weapons. They can be quite useful, but I think I'll pass. Now, the thing about spears that I didn't mention is that they are kind of bad later in the game, because they are really bad at dealing with armor, and you will start getting heavily armored enemies in the mid-game and late-game. So even if you equip everyone with spears early on, which is a pretty good starting strategy, you have to transition into different weapon types eventually. So yeah, that's another thing to keep in mind. Anything else? I don't want this to take too long. We'll probably visit another town to get more gear. So who's going to be best at actually hitting things? 16 to melee skill. Okay, so let's give this guy a spear and a shield. With the bonus, he will have the highest chance to hit things. We should also move our ranged guy to the second line. This does actually have effect on where you start when combat starts. He will be behind the lines if you put him in the second line. And these are reserves. If you put anyone here, he will not be in combat at all. You can bring up to 12 brothers into combat. So if you have more than 12 in your company, some of them will have to be in reserves. Anyway, how about the two-hander? We can still use it, we just need to be careful when we run around with it. Okay, that will do for now, we need to visit more towns. Before we do anything serious. So, who's going to use the Fangshire? Is that the best helmet we got? Pretty sure that's going to be the best helmet we got, yep. Okay, so let's give it to our spear guy with talent in melee. Yep, that's one of the starting brothers. He might end up being our core. Alright, good enough. So let's go and visit other towns. The one we need to go to, Suderborg. Off we go then. Still need to buy more gear. Along the way. Yeah, as usual, feel free to pause and read it if you want. So... Let's check who we can hire. Yeah, some of these guys are way more expensive. 
but that's partially because they start at higher level. And also, some backgrounds are only really available on more expensive recruits, like the Hedge Knight is a really good background, but these are always going to be expensive. Anyway, we go to the Houndmaster, Servant, and Bowyer. Now, I remember which backgrounds are really bad, and you don't want to pick them up unless you are really desperate. So, the one that's really bad, from what I remember, is the Beggar, because the Beggars get lower health and lower maximum fatigue and lower resolve. And these are all really important stats. So you might want to avoid Beggars, unless you are really desperate because they are super cheap. There's also the Miner, which gets slightly higher health, but he gets a huge maximum fatigue penalty. So mostly not worth it. I think the Miner has like the biggest fatigue penalty out of any background in the game. I avoid Miners, unless I'm really desperate. Alright, we'll grab these two guys. I'm not quite willing to spend 1000, because we need that money for gear. We'll grab these two, and there's one more. That's an apprentice. Yep. Sounds good. We'll grab that guy too. And let's check their talents. How good are they? Okay, ranged skill and ranged defense. That's nice. So this guy is definitely going to be ranged, no doubt about that. We might not be able to buy a quiver though. Not in this town. Because that usually requires a Fletcher. You can't always buy that at the market. Oh yeah, we do have one at the market. But actually, bows are pretty bad until you hit around 60 in ranged skill. Crossbows are generally better early on. But it doesn't look like we can buy a crossbow in here. We might want to go for a regular bow. Now, we can buy a cheaper bow, which is damaged, and then use some of our tools. But either they're not. And if you look at the prices of the tolls, they cost 222 gold in this town. And in the last one it was 290, something like that. You definitely need to pay attention to prices, because they will vary a lot. Sometimes you can buy something cheap and sell it way higher in a different city. And it's a completely valid way of making gold. Definitely. Anyway, let's buy a bow and a quiver, because without a quiver you will actually not be able to shoot, I'm just saying. And we'll need some headgear. So, a straw hat for a ranged guy. So, these are decent, but also more expensive. Can we buy a spear? Let's see. Yes, we can buy a spear. So, let's grab that. Looks like that's the only one in here. Yep, seems like it. We can always try to visit other towns. Because we don't want to get as many spirits as possible for the 20% chance to hit bonus. 20% chance to hit early on is just massive. It makes a huge amount of difference. So that's why I tend to favor spirits early on. We do need more shields as well. So let's see. Prices seem to be pretty good in here. Oh yeah, there is a weaponsmith. Let's check the weaponsmith. These are way more expensive. We can't afford most of these weapons. Yep, definitely not. So, a shield. 150. This one is worse. 100 is fine. We can grab the buckler as well. It's better than nothing. It's way better than nothing. Having a shield versus not having a shield basically triples or even quadruples your defense. So shields are just so good, especially for how cheap they are early on. Now, who has the best skill level here? Let's see, someone who doesn't have gear yet. 52, but no talent. Yeah, this guy will be a better ranged, because he has ranged defense and ranged skill. So in the back line. Everyone else will be melee, I think. Although, yeah, this guy would also make decent ranged eventually. But he can also make decent melee. Yeah, he's probably going to be melee, I would say. 47, yeah, that's kind of bad. This guy has melee defense. Alright, so who is going to use that spear then? 52, 56, 
I think it should be this guy, actually. We'll give the 200 to someone else. I just want to maximize the chance to hit. Okay, so these three guys have spears. They will be the core. You can use a 200, that's the net. You can immobilize your enemy. The net, it can be really important against some of the enemies later in the game. But it's a bit too early to talk about that. Grab the hat. And you will get the bow, the arrows. And the hat. I think that's basically it. We could use more spears. You can grab the 200. But I would prefer to replace it with a spear, if we can find one to buy. Alright, this looks reasonable enough for now. So, let's go and visit some other towns. First, we'll go back to Solheim. And then maybe go to Windberg to the south. Or to Grottenhaven to the north. Doesn't really matter all that much. We'll check all of them eventually. So, unfinished business. That's going to be our contract. Travel to Hogarth Refuge, north east of Sonheim, right here. And kill Hogarth the Weasel. We'll get 400 crowns on completion. However, I think this is going to be a good moment to make a cut. I'll do that fight in the next episode. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know what you think about Battle Brothers in the comments below. And I'll see you next time.